consistent with his character, namely that he sued people all the time. The difference is now he has nuclear weapons instead of a team of lawyers, although he has that too. And I think that that's important because the fact that he has the nuclear weapons makes him dangerous to all of us. And I think that was John's point, that accidents can happen, mistakes can happen, things can happen, even though he always threatens to sue and maybe his use of threats with nuclear weapons is the same kind of process because that's how he gets his way. But I think that the danger is that there could be a mistake, and that's why there has to be limits uh, implemented. It's not about diagnosis as much as a description of a man who's obsessed. Uh, Tom Goldman, I'm a colleague of uh, John and Justin, and uh, you have to hold it up too. Psychoanalyst here. Uh, I, I want to make a couple of comments. One, one is that I think everything that's been said here is very powerful and very true and very important. Um, I think. Um, uh, it's a well-known well cartoon. Maybe it's come out in very in, in many publications. I remember the one in New Yorker where the analyst is sitting behind the patient, and he reaches over, he reaches over and smashes the patient in the face and says, "Maybe that will knock some sense into you." <laughs> and that, that speaks to how how relieving it can be to anxiety and passivity in the face of anxiety and a sense of danger to take action. Right. To me, uh, someone said to me out in the in the uh, during lunch. This this uh, this is very frightening. It it it's, uh, makes me anxious. And I, and I said my response is this is one of the most reassuring things that's happened to me since Trump has been president. That we have this group meeting here and we're thinking about action. Mm -hmm. So uh, I think this is extremely important for curing ourselves and as a way to uh, help cure the country. The, the other point is a little more limited, but I think it's relevant. It has to do with the nature of diagnostic examinations. I would, I would say, just as many of the uh, speakers uh, in the uh, film said, that in the case of Trump, uh, it's all out there. I mean, you, we see most of, what we, most of what is important is enacted. It's, it's right out there. It's speech and action, which are right out there in public, including the lawsuits, including the threats. Um, and there are even more, but because of Trump's narcissistic bubble. Uh, th this is a concept that was uh, written about by Vamik Volkan, who just came out with another book about uh, um, uh, evils uh, in the world. Um, the, the person in, a, in a, a narcissist are in a kind of a bubble where they are prevented, they, they feel themselves to be insulated from direct contact with the world, uh, the outside world. So they have the illusion that they, for example, can say anything at all, and that it won't be heard, it won't be interpreted. And I thought of an example coming from the early first month, I think, of Trump's presidency, or maybe the second month. It's when the health care uh, uh, stuff was beginning to come out and be debated very furiously. And uh, during an interview with a female interviewer on TV, I'm sorry, I've forgotten the name of the interviewer, but it was, Trump had, had responded to a question about how, you know, how is it going or how do you like uh, what's happening here. And he said, you know, this healthcare stuff is really complicated. <laughs> now you think about that for a minute, that's remarkable. Here's the President of the United States saying to a female interviewer, who I think he probably assumes that he's safe, and he's saying, I don't know what the hell I'm doing here. I'm just learning. I'm just learning what the hell this job is all about. I don't know how to do it. And he, he feels safe, safe to make a comment that that in public. Somehow he must have the illusion that it's not going to come back to haunt him, that it's not going to be show, the direct evidence of his incompetence. Um, so is that kind, of, that kind of narcissism and the belief that he is somehow insulated? You know, we used to talk about Reagan as a Teflon president. Well, he wants to be the Teflon president, too. Uh, well, he wants to be able to penetrate that Teflon with, with real, real powerful uh, explosives. Well, let's let the but, panel respond. But, yes, uh, so <laughs> I'll, I'll shut up and the panel respond. <laughs> One of the things we have to offer as professionals is not just focusing on, on the, uh, not just focusing on the surface picture, but what's underneath. And, what, and I am regularly impressed by how thin-skinned 
uh, our president is, how ready he is to push back, and it's, and it's when he is challenged in any way at the very magnitude of that challenge response is quite scary at times. Uh, but that's something we have to be communicating, not just what's going on on the surface, but what this gives evidence to uh, I, that's underneath the surface. And that's terribly, terribly important. One other thing, the reason to make a diagnosis is to figure out what we're dealing with and also to develop a sense of a treatment plan. I think that regardless of the diagnosis, because of Trump's inability to think and respond, he is not treatable. So therefore, in medicine, we talk about uh, three kinds of treatments. We talk about prevention, we talk about acute treatment, and we talk about chronic treatment. That's uh, Ramazzini in 1700 said that. So, so, but the point is that we can only do prevention. And the prevention is we can't prevent him from right now doing very much other than the fact that the Congress has prevented him from overturning the ACA in, you know, in terms of their voting. But we need to prevent him from having access uh, and the ability to use these weapons, as John's saying. I'm just trying to reinforce that. But it's about prevention. We can't cure it. Um, Mauricio, I think in terms of whether or not it's important to <coughs> understand in depth the quality and communicate and educate journalists and people and policymakers, it's essential because unless you really understand a narcissistic personality disorder, you may underestimate the danger that Trump poses. For example, unless you really know about what it means to have no empathy, no capacity for authentic guilt, no compassion, if you don't know those details about borderline personality disorder and narcissistic personality disorder, then you may not feel it's as, as urgent as others say to get in the way of Trump being able to pull that nuclear trigger. So I think knowing the details and the depths of the diagnosis are very, very important for that reason in, let's say, making predictions about someone's behavior. Could I respond to that? No, I'm sorry. I think we've got another question. Maybe if we have time at the end, you think so? Okay, yeah, we do want to let other people have a chance. Sorry, that's okay. Um, I had a question. Um, it's brought to mind when you talk about nuclear weapons and the threat of nuclear war, but is there any role of uh, physicians for social responsibility or like collaboration of that group with mental health workers and like moving forward? together as like a cohesive unit to get any stuff done? It's a great idea. Um, I used to be the, very involved with the PSR, president of the DC chapter for about 10 years. Um, they are active in this, but again, they're not doing anything about setting limits. They're much more focused on proliferation than they are on the abuse of the weapons that already exist. And I think that's the issue. There was a group recently that just got the Nobel Peace Prize. Uh, out of fin Finland or Sweden that, that essentially is very much towards nuclear disarmament. But the issue I think was, the question is about setting limits. And, and to me, uh, and all of the three of us, and many of us in the room have worked in inpatient units in psychiatry. And when you have somebody like Trump as a patient, the first thing you do is set limits. And I think this is what needs to be done. Pure and simple. Hi, um, my name is Pamela Brewa. I'm a clinician as well, and so on. One of the things that really strikes me and many of my colleagues is the sense as clinicians of hopelessness. And so the fact that this group is here and, and gathering support across the nation, I think is very hopeful and anxiety reducing in some ways for many of us. The other thing I want to acknowledge is that it really kind of struck me as I walked into the room that there were very few persons of color um, in this room. And so I think, I mean, certainly we are impacted in all kinds of ways um, that other people in this room may not be impacted upon in the same way. And so I think it's really important that this organization reach out to a broad range of organizations, particularly people of color, who have just 
a lot to lose, including our lives, whether he hits a button or not. You got it. Yeah. So my name is Dan Rosenbaum. I'm not a uh, therapist by any means. My wife is one, and uh, she didn't drag me here. I was really interested in the subject matter, and it was great. I uh, heard a lot about it from my wife and her friends, narcissism and all those things, but this was very informative. But my question is uh, directed, I guess, to everybody. Um, we heard a lot about legislation, lobbying, whatever. What the heck's going on with the APA? I mean, is anybody pressing them? to change, to withdraw, to go, oh, I mean, that would seem to be the first step. You're looking at them. And, and you're looking at them. And, and so what's going on? I mean, why wasn't that done months ago? I think one of the things that must be emphasized, uh, uh, and Alan Dyer at uh, George Washington has played a leading role in addressing this, when the uh, Goldwater Rule was established, it was an ethical principle, which means something to rely on, something to turn towards, but not something to be real ruled by. And the very question you asked, what about the Goldwater Rule? There's a difference between a rule which says thou shalt not, and as John has uh, really very nicely addressed, there's only one person who can uh, 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 even uh, attend to that rule, uh, and that's the person who has uh, uh, Trump in psychoanalysis or something along these lines. So that uh, there is a, a, a healthy movement, but a, but a ma major clash of the factions within the APA and the APA leadership. I was on a panel at the San Diego meeting of the APA. Uh, and presented on constraints, uh, constraints and exaggerated responses of the of the Goldwater Rule, and we had a professor of philosophy talk about the difference between an ethical rule and a principle. But we have somehow regressed so that uh, the membership is carrying within them uh, at this point: Thou shalt not ever say anything uh, 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 useful. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> if you pursue this analogy, uh, envision this thought experiment. If a gunman walked in here, uh, walked into the public library, we were all in the public library, and a gunman walked in and said, everyone here is going to die today. And I said, John, call the police. And someone turned around and said, shh, this is a library. <laughs> I have two questions. Uh, one's very political based on the followers. I have already uh, brought this up to one of our speakers, but I'd like to hear from all of them. Uh, the people that Trump authentically understands when he said I could shoot someone and they wouldn't matter, his supporters, I want to know more about them. Who are they and why do they support him? For a couple of reasons. Uh, I'm very politically active and uh, one of the things I read a lot of analysis of why the Republicans who know he's nuts won't uh, do anything about it is because of his followers. They're afraid of them. Is there some kind of an analysis of that that you could put forth that we could start getting the word out, something that could help the Republicans not fear this base so that we could work that angle? That's the first part. The second one is completely different. The people around Trump, when he pushes the button, what kind of psychology can one, again, encourage through media or whatever to those people around him to take the risk, whatever that is personally, to stop him? Those are the two questions for everybody. Thank you. I think this is a key question that, that you're asking here, uh, and that who are they from whom we get such a support? Uh, you cannot view uh, Trump in isolation. You have to speak about 
the Trump and his followers, and he has a unique knack to appeal to people and have them feel not alone and that there's someone who understands me and, and, and what I'm going through uh, and, is, and is going to protect me. This is a charismatic leader-follower relationship, something I've, I've written about, and, and you, you have to look at this as an entity beyond the individual. It is Trump with his followers who are there uh, and see yeah, him talking to them in a way that conveys an understanding that others are not, uh, that others are not uh, able, able to do you with microphones this way. Uh, that, 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 that others are not somehow reaching that segment of the population. With all that's gone on, that he stays steadily at that 33% or 35% or whatever it is, is very scary. And it says that other politicians are not able to reach this audience. And, and we, we've really got to grapple with this because it's crucial. I just